Hello, everyone. My name is Rigoberto Gonzalez. I am very happy to be part of this hard hat reading series for Poets House. Um, Poets House is an institution that I have long admired ever since I moved to New York City in 1997. I remember going to its location uh, back in the day on Spring Street and enjoying the, the, the library and uh, being very much impressed and uh, thrilled to know that I was part of this very huge uh, legacy and community of, of writers and poets. Um, I'm hopeful that it will return uh, to its uh, heyday, that it will be part of our lives once again. Um, and you know, Poets House, they, you have the support of many communities and many people across the country, including myself. So the poem we're gonna read first is by Saeed Jones from his collection, Alive at the End of the World. And this is a book that challenges itself to find glimmers of hope uh, during these bleak times. And I think that, that is a, that's a valuable lesson for all of us, a valuable guide for each and every one of us who, has, who is definitely inhabiting this very difficult period. Uh, so Alive at the End of the World is the name of the collection, and so are a number of the poems within the book. And this is one of them. Alive at the End of the World, by Saeed Jones. I hear the sirens run. I hear the sirens and run, a hand over my silhouette, surprised not to find bullet wounds, burns, or history. But now, ambered under the streetlight, he pulls me in for a kiss again, and I decide, briefly, to let the world kill itself, however it chooses. Yes, I hear the sirens, and I am their scream, but tonight, I will moan a future into my man's mouth. A beautiful poem. I'll be reading a few of my own poems from my a new collection, To the Boy Who Was Night. And this one is called um, A Note on Resentment. A Note on Resentment. While traveling in Mexico, I spent a weekend with friends of friends in Texcoco. They had a white dog. I don't recall whether he had been inherited or rescued, but I won't forget this detail. He had worked in a circus. To prove it, my host threw a stuffed animal into the pen and the dog seized it, running a wide circle close to the fence as if in rehearsal for a performance in the ring. But instead of simply holding the stuffed animal as he ran, he swatted it about violently a kind of rage that seemed unbecoming of his training. He thinks it's the monkey, my host told me. He's likely traumatized from all those times he had to carry the monkey on his back, so now he's getting his revenge. My host laughed at this speculation, which seemed logical, if not a bit unfair, since the monkey too had been trained to ride the dog like a horse, likely wearing a precious hat and leather vest. The monkey too had been imprisoned by its guard, its commands, its inability to break out of an indoctrination that shrunk its knowledge of its body, agency, and place in the world. I watched and pondered, who am I in this equation, the dog or the monkey? I used to be the monkey, locked inside my fear of not being liked, trapped by the need to be loved. But now I'm the dog, I'm definitely the dog. I hope to shake past burdens off, but even into middle age, I'm still unwilling to let go. The second one is called Toston. And the, the poem will explain what a Toston is. Toston. And then you open your sleepy eyes one morning to discover that half a century has gone by that you left your beloved mother 38 years behind, your father 14. You don't remember ever wearing the white gown of virginity because someone stole it long before you knew such a gown existed. Yet you won't forget about the theft because since then, every man who touches you walks away with something. You keep a small clay pot next to the bed. It will fit inside the space in your chest once you lose the last chip of your heart. That's the golden rule of the body. Whatever you keep inside is breakable. You stop trying to glue your mouth back together. 
You stop trying to glue your youth back together because that which has shattered remains shattered. And besides, it's not a pretty picture anyhow. Neither are most of the days that followed. The saving grace is that no one's left to pressure you to clean yourself up. You've grown and now you're growing old. What's worth the hassle to mend if you can't wear it again? What's the point of regret when every eyewitness to your mistakes has died? You stay in bed because you have no one to feed. This doesn't bring you sorrow. The silence in the room is neither haunting or daunting. The floor collects the cells of your skin and no one else's. You're breathing in only yourself in the dust. Again, this doesn't sadden you one bit. Perhaps you used up the last drops of grief after you lost your children. When you die, you're the last piece of evidence that your parents ever lived. And you, what proof that you were once loved? Slowly, you rise and walk from run, one room to another, and both rooms scarcely notice the difference. You are, dear friend, officially a tostón, that 50 cent Mexican coin, half a peso, relic of the past, purveyor of the simple pleasures of your childhood, paletita, dulce sabor mango, canica, ojo de dragón, galletita de mantequilla, cacahuate japonés. Montezuma's profile is engraved on this, on this silver moon, he always facing away from the sea. Looking back at the ruins of Tenochtitlan, not with anguish or disdain, but with a dignified gaze that says, what is done is done. No use crying over what can never change or what is gone. Thank you very much. <laughs>